Today we talk clerics on Dungeon Craft. If you enjoy our content, why not subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications? Thank you. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and today we're talking clerics. A few months back, I ran an episode on how I run magic in my game. The upshot of that episode is if a magic user wants to cast a spell, it doesn't go off automatically. They have to roll a 20-sided die, just like anyone else trying to do anything. I, the Dungeon Master, set the target number based on the difficulty of the spell, and if the wizard rolls high enough, the spell goes off. Then they roll a second 20-sided die to see how successful they were. On a roll of natural one, something terrible goes wrong, and the spell goes haywire or backfires on the wizard. So people have asked, do I use the same system with clerics? And the answer is, kind of. And I'm going to walk you through it in this episode. People have also asked about druids, but I'm going to save them for a separate episode. Personally, I don't play that much with druids. I have an urban-based campaign. I also think that their spells are more akin to magic user spells. So we're going to save them for later and just concentrate on clerics today. This video is going to have three parts. First, how clerics were originally conceived. Second, how I conceive of clerics. And finally, the rules I use for running clerics in my game. Clerics are unique in the classes of D&D because they're the only ones that don't have a literary tradition. In Lord of the Rings, Aragorn is the ranger, Conan is the barbarian, Merlin is the wizard, Grey Mouser is the thief, but clerics are their own thing. They're an original creation by D&D co-creator Dave Arneson for his Blackmoor campaign. The first player to play a cleric was Mike Carr, who would go on to design module B1, In Search of the Unknown. So any game, video game, board game that has a healer type or a cleric type character, they are directly influenced by the work of Dave Arneson. Clerics are modeled on a number of sources. Historically, they're modeled on holy orders like the Knights Templar and Knights Hospitaller. And in terms of fiction, they're modeled on Hammer Horror Films, the Dracula series where Van Helsing is always holding up an iron cross and Christopher Lee's Dracula is always going <sighs> That's where Arneson got the idea of clerics turning the undead. Arneson conceived of clerics as occupying a space between wizard and warrior. They had the armor of a warrior but not all access to the weapons and they didn't have as many hit points. And they had access to spells, but they weren't as powerful as magic user spells. In this version of the game, clerics couldn't even cast spells on first level. They had to wait till second level. And their selection of spells was very limited. These include cure wounds, detect evil, light protection, purify food and water. So my problem with clerics in 5th edition is I think they become way too powerful. They're something like five times as powerful as the cleric in this version of the game who couldn't cast spells and might only have three hit points on first level and four hit points on second level. The war domain allows clerics an extra attack as a bonus action. The light domain allows them to cast powerful wizard spells like burning hands and wall of fire. To me, something's wrong about that. It's just too close to those wizard powers and fighter powers. It begs the question, strategically, why would you play a fighter when you could just play a war cleric and get the ability to have an extra attack and heal yourself? Why would you play a wizard when you could cast some of the most offensive wizard spells and still wear armor. But the most overpowered spells are the healing spells. Healing Word, for example, allows a cleric to heal someone as a bonus action from 60 feet away. That's really powerful. Why? Because a wizard or barbarian with zero hit points can do nothing. But a wizard or barbarian who just had Healing Word cast on them and have five hit points can rage and cast fireball spells. I think clerics are the most powerful class in the game because they enable the rest of the players to maximize their character's offensive capabilities. Two, few people play clerics like clerics. Clerics should be priests and nuns constantly proselytizing, trying to win converts over to their cause, talking about their god at all times, but I seldom see players doing that. It's, it's mostly just another fighter spellcaster type. I have seen players play clerics convincingly, but it seems to be more of an exception than the norm. Three, the disappearing cleric. The disappearing cleric is when your party wants to do something absolutely morally reprehensible that the cleric wouldn't allow, so they create an absurd errand for that cleric to run so they could do whatever it is they want to do. Classic example, the players take a bunch of goblins prisoner and want to kill them, but they can't because the cleric is in the room. Hey, cleric, why don't you go back one room and check the rear and make sure no one's sneaking up on us? And when the cleric gets back, they say, I don't know how this happened. The goblins' heads popped off. In my own campaign in the last session, the players caught off up to this villain that they hated for a long time. And she was in a prison cell. She had no armor, no weapons, no spells, no hit points, no ability to attack them whatsoever. She's just a zero-level human. And everybody knew that they were going to kill her. And the cleric made up the excuse that he had to help another character 
carry a box of potions down the stairs so they wouldn't get broken. That's egregious metagaming. That's players wanting all the powers of the cleric without any of the drawbacks and weaknesses. And I think that's just lame. This is how I conceive of clerics. Clerics are the hammers of the gods, willingly facing death without fear and fully expecting martyrdom. The cleric's objective is sainthood. They're fearless. Their lives are characterized by deep prayer, selflessness, and strict discipline. Clerics belong to holy orders. Orders are, well, they're orderly and therefore lawful in nature. They have hierarchies. Clerics take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience just like the historical Knights Templar did. Poverty means the cleric doesn't accept rewards. If they do get 10,000 gold pieces from a dragon horde, they're going to use that money to build a shrine to their god, commemorating the dragon's defeat and using the opportunity to convert the local populace. They may use wealth to upgrade their weapons and armor, but they only keep the gold that they can carry with them. Chastity. The cleric's goal is martyrdom. A spouse and children would distract them from their mission. Clerics are traveling constantly to where evil can be found. That's not compatible with family life. Obedience. Churches have hierarchies. Clerics obey their superiors, who send them on missions to defeat the forces of evil. These missions might last months or years. Your cynical 21st century players might balk at the idea of blind obedience, but in the Middle Ages, this was expected. Finally, clerics are extremely rare, like saints. They're not the local village priest or nun. They're like Joan of Arc or St. George, slaying dragons and performing miracles. So in my game, clerics have to abide by a strict code. Their life is one of prayer, fasting, and smashing evil. Clerics carry a holy tome at all times and will quote liberally from it. The tome serves as a backup weapon. In the last session, my cleric beat a guy to death with it. Clerics will not travel or adventure or cast spells on the Sabbath day. Every organized religion has a Sabbath day and certain food that they won't eat. Same thing with clerics. Clerics only heal people who share their faith. If Brunt the Warrior believes in Sky Coast, the cleric of Sky Coast will heal him. But she's under no obligation to heal Deathbringer, the Oathbreaker Paladin. Finally, clerics always accept surrender. In the Middle Ages, killing prisoners was strictly against the rules of engagement. It still is today, and violators are subject to the death penalty. If you killed prisoners, your opponents would retaliate by killing their prisoners. Clerics are rule followers and representatives of law and order. If Darkon the Malevolent, the ultimate villain in your campaign, surrenders, the cleric will accept his surrender and protect Darkon to the death. The cleric doesn't care if the other characters kill him. His objective is martyrdom, and he's got a fast pass to heaven. They're not killing him, they're making him a saint. This level of determination distinguishes the cleric from all the other classes, most of whom are just mercenaries. The cleric, by contrast, has a holy cause. This, incidentally, is what happened to the real St. George of St. George and the Dragon fame. He was killed by his friends when he refused to compromise his values. On the one hand, clerics have access to tremendous power, but on the other hand, they have to abide by a strict moral code, and that creates game balance. Characters can't just have awesome powers with no limitations. So regarding domains, I don't play with domains myself, but if I did, I would limit access to them based on the geography of my campaign world. War clerics would only emerge from a region where war is a constant. A place like Sparta that's surrounded by enemies, where all children are taught at a young age how to fight, where infants who have one leg shorter than the other are left to die on a hillside. The ethos of that society will value strength and courage over all. They're not going to be able to afford to take every infant and raise them to adulthood because they're constantly under attack and that would weaken them and open up to them to the to vulnerabilities and the possibility of extinction. Contrast that with a life cleric. A life cleric would probably come from a, a region which is more peaceful. It's probably got boundaries like mountains or an ocean on two sides. A society like that would place mercy and compassion above all other values. A nature cleric would have to come from a rural area. A tempest cleric from an area that has access to the sea. If your campaign is set in the desert, it doesn't make sense to allow the players to play a tempest cleric. If they could make it rain, it wouldn't be a desert. So even if you're playing strict 5e D&D &D and you're not going to take any of the rest of the advice in this video, think carefully about the domains and you're perfectly within your rights as a dungeon master to limit your player's access to those domains based on the geography of your campaign. So here are my rules for casting cleric spells. When a cleric casts a spell, it's not an incantation, it's a prayer. They're asking the god that they believe in to intervene on their behalf in a particular way. Clerics can only cast one spell per day per level, so a fourth level cleric can only cast four spells a day. Just like magic users, a cleric player rolls a d20 to determine if a spell is successful. 
My rationale is this. If the cleric spells always worked, then it would be the god serving the cleric and not the other way around. The cleric is trying to communicate with the god and beg them to intervene. A high roll means that the cleric's faith is strong and the god has chosen to intervene in the way that the cleric requests. A low roll means the cleric's faith is weak, or it may simply mean the god has chosen not to intervene. Why? I don't know. It's all part of the god's plan. The target number is set arbitrarily by the DM, taking into consideration things like what is the level of the miracle that the cleric wants to make manifest, and what is the level of the cleric. I treat the spell descriptions as a guideline, and I don't restrict the low-level clerics to just low-level spells. The first-level cleric can cast Animate Dead. They can pray for any spell they want. It's just unlikely that they'll be successful. I would require them to roll a natural 20 or something like that. Higher level clerics need an easier target number, just like higher level fighters need lower to hit numbers. So if a low level cleric wants to cure light wounds, it would be something like a 10, but a high level cleric would need a 5 to cast the same spell. The cleric adds their wisdom bonus to the roll in the same way a fighter adds their strength bonus and a wizard adds their intelligent bonus to their spell casting roll. If a cleric succeeds, they roll a second die to determine how successful the spell was. If they cast Cure Light Wounds and they follow it with a 2, well, they probably only heal a couple of hit points. But on a high roll, like a 16, they might heal 10 or 12 hit points. It's up to the discretion of the DM. If second level cleric wants to turn this horde of zombies, she's got a plus three wisdom bonus. I say she's got to roll a 10. She rolls a 16. She's successful. Now she rolls a second time to determine how successful. Seven. Two of the zombies flee. That's how I run turn the undead. Now what happens if a cleric rolls a one? For a cleric, it's a crisis of faith. The connection between the cleric and the god is severed. The cleric feels hopeless and abandoned in their time of need. Or perhaps he has a moment of weakness where he imagines giving in to forbidden desires. second 20-sided die to determine how many rounds the connection is severed, and they can't cast spells during that time. On a natural 20, the connection between the cleric and the god is completely severed. In order to re-establish it, the cleric has to go into a wilderness for 20 consecutive days and do nothing but pray, fast, and flagellate themselves until those impure thoughts are purged from their heads and the connection between they and their god is re-established. If they can't do it, they abandon their faith become another class. So people always ask, do you allow resurrection in your campaign? Do you allow your players to raise the dead? And the answer is no. That's like a high level spell and my highest level characters are something like six level after mm, 25 years. So they're not able to do that. But if I were to do it, I would require something like a natural 20 no matter how high the level of the cleric is. For death to mean anything, it's got to be pretty permanent. Other people like a high fantasy game where people come back to life regularly, but for me, it's really a permanent thing. The final limitation of the cleric is ultimately the gods themselves. And you, the dungeon master, is playing that NPC god. So, the, with the disappearing cleric trick, this is why it doesn't work. Malleus the cleric may take the potions down the stairs while the rest of the party kills the prisoner. You could make the argument Malleus does know what happened, but the god does, and the god will never allow those players to be healed again. You can lie to other players and NPCs. You can't lie to the gods. So that's how I run clerics. I hope this video has been worth the wait. If you enjoyed it, give it the thumbs up. If you have questions, comments, put them below. This has been Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the table. If you enjoyed today's content, click the Dungeon Door logo to subscribe to the channel and the bell icon to receive notifications. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at DungeonCraft. Thank you.